Good evening. Good evening. Brothers and sisters, I am coming to speak with open heart, open mind, and ears. We came together today because we all were created from Adam and Eve and became nations and people in this world to know each other and hope all of us that we are coming to know each other and knowing doesn't mean to know the name or the face. Knowing is to go deeper, to connect, to understand, to show passion, empathy to others. The one you know really, you don't need to talk to. To connect with the hearts. And that's what is needed today from all of us, to know each other and to show passion with each other. I am honored and the privilege to be invited to speak at your conference, Christ at the Checkpoint. I feel angry about this title, Christ at the Checkpoint. It's a hopeful and inspiring gathering because Christ who represents the sacred humanity, hope and life, his message and mission was always to save and free humanity, to purify clean bodies, minds, and hearts, to respect, value the lives of human beings, and advocate for equality, dignity, freedom, and justice for all, for the humankind, family, nature, environment, and the human fellows in this world. I would like to thank all those who were behind this inspiring and hopeful conference. I am coming to speak as a father, as educator, as a Palestinian, and now I am Canadian physician, advocating, and most importantly, as a human. Today, you have come to this conference to hear and see with your ears and eyes who are the Palestinians. The strength of Palestinians and the story of the Palestinian people. Because the stories are not just words. Stories, it has a meaning. It's data. It's information we need to use in our life and to guide us. We are, as Palestinians, we are a nation and people with civilization, history, potential, dreams, and hopes who aspire, like other nations, for freedom and independence. We don't want to delete anyone, but to be added to other nations as neighbors. Palestinians harbor no desire for revenge, and we don't hate anyone. As the media describes us, we are people who want to succeed and be free. And we want others at the same time to be free. Freedom must not stop at the borders of the Palestinian people. Palestinians harbor no desire for revenge. And the misery, the injustice, violence, hatred, poverty, fears, and diseases are endemic and increasing all over the world. 
making it a dangerous place where mostly women, children, and the poor are the victims. This suffering is man-made and caused by people and the constitutions which are not made by God or the rules of nature. This is where hope can begin because it's man-made. And I can challenge all man-made suffering by taking responsibility. The biggest challenge in this world is individual responsibility. We try to challenge each other and to blame each other. It's time to take responsibility. Every day, each of us adds a small portion to watching it, think it, it's not important, and saying, what can we do? What makes the evil flourish are good people who are doing nothing to ask what's the greatest challenge to our success in this world. There are serious challenges facing the world, but I believe that the biggest challenge, as I said, is personal responsibility. Taking personal responsibility transcends circumstances and situation in which we find ourselves. One of the most important ingredients for moving forward is the knowledge of what we want exactly and to creating a plan on how to achieve it, whatever the challenges and others say. Why I am here and where I am going and how and to have a sense of purpose. We need first to start the process of reconciliation, to reconcile first with our Creator, with God. How can we start the process of reconciliation between each other and we didn't reconcile with God? The first step in reconciliation is to reconcile with God then everything else will be easier. And the reconciliation with each other will be much easier. My life as a Palestinian refugee was a tragedy and was a war. I lived fighting to survive every day in my life till now. I am living just to survive. In the time we see others who are living to fight. As a child, I never tasted my childhood. My life, as I said, was a war. And in this world, people are fighting to live and others are living to fight. But as life, increased my aches, my pain and suffering. It also amplified my maturity, awareness, strength, and I didn't allow all the difficulties to kill my dreams. I found myself in a life as a challenging, as a raging and wild ocean. But till now, my people are facing the same, even worse, because time should help to improve the situation. But time is working against our Palestinian people. They are suffering. I have been this summer in Gaza Strip. Gaza Strip is a place where children are without a childhood. It's a human being without their well-being. It's lifeless. It's jobless. It's hopeless. It's helpless. But for me and for the Palestinian people, every great dream begins with a dreamer. In this world, someone can kill. 
than torture, can build walls, can occupy, but can't prevent us from dreaming and having hopes and to be determined. And Palestinian people are dreamers and have big hopes. Always, you need to remember that you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. In our life, we face hardships, challenges, ups and downs, and that's life. But we, we, we want to discover ways to be able to learn and find calmness inside ourselves for a better world for ourselves and others. We need to challenge ourselves to work for a just human peace. I understand and realize the meaning of suffering and loss, the loss of loved ones, safety, security, hunger, pain, being homeless, being demolished houses. And I also understand and feel the suffering of Israelis who have lost loved ones and live in fear. But what is the best way to get rid of the suffering in our world? What is the best way to resume hope in life? And when we speak about war, what is war? In the time the world and every corner is endemic with war and violence. Conflict arises when we violate someone's honor and dignity and destroy both their self-esteem and self-respect. These socioeconomic diseases, they cross barriers and borders, and we live in a small world. We all, in this world, we live and ride one boat. No one is far from risk. Maybe we are far by distance, and we are impacted either directly or indirectly by any conflict in this world. Conflict is the result of mistrust and suspicion. Even though we are now in the 21st century, it seems a humankind hasn't learned the lesson. We still have nations, countries, dominating, oppressing, and occupying other nations and countries. We still have parties, factions, media groups who want to control how people even think and how they live. That's why we still have war and conflict around the globe, and the world is endemic with violence, hatred, incitement, and fear. But how much of war do we know and see through the media? Is it the soldier who is killed or wounded? Or the innocent child, daughter, mother, or old? War is about our children, about our grandchildren dying before they are fully adults, or being disfigured, wounded, or mentally scarred for life. We hear and see just the numbers. It's time to look at people as people, as a human. It's shame, unethical, immoral, to think of a human beings, our human fellows, as a statistics or numbers. There are people with names, with faces, with parents, with the dreams, with the future, with the plans and hope, and all of them are equal. And we need to appreciate all of them and to speak about all of them and to zoom in about other human fellows. People are people and they are equal to be judged, not by political interest. And we should not be part of it, but be part of exposing it. War is about hundreds of thousands of human beings dying years before their time. 
It's our children seeing their bodies, limbs blown off their bodies. It's millions of people separated forever from the ones they loved. No one knows the loss until it happens. How simple is the war when we see it with the glasses? Our Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish said, he who looks at the sea doesn't know the sea. He who sits on the shore doesn't know the sea. Only he who immerses himself, dives, takes risk, and forgets the sea in the sea. No one knows the suffering until they have suffered. No one knows the freedom until they have lost it. They don't know that war is not raging fire in the cavities of the cannons, but in the hearts, in the minds and souls of the people and their ideas do. War has much larger cause to society, especially to women and the children who are losing the beloved ones. We need to fight against this disease and the leading risk factors causing the human suffering. We need to take things to the hearts and pursue the ethics and integrity of a humanity. We need to protect people in this world who are our human fellows. War is a genocide. It's a torture, propaganda, dishonesty, and the slavery to humanity. War and injustice are not just to be documented, but to be prevented. As in medicine, we don't document diseases, we want to prevent diseases. There is no humanitarian holy war. Only peace is sacred and humanitarian. When war ends, all celebrate the victory, but there is no victory in war. All are losers. A victory is not built at the expense of innocent human beings. Is it a victory if hatred, animosity, bloodshed, pain, and fear are increased? Is it a victory which produces orphans and destruction and wound the souls that don't heal? as a wounded, bereaved father who lost beloved children. I feel the suffering of all human beings in this world. Eisenhower said, every gun that is made, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed. Those who are cold and not clothed. This world is not spending money alone. It's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of the threatening war, it's a humanity hanging from cross of iron. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. In order to overcome our world problems, this needs honesty and the truth. In medicine, in order to heal the patient, I need to have accurate diagnosis. Once I have accurate diagnosis, I can set up the right treatment. And the truth goes side by side with the responsibility. Jesus said in Gospel of John, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It makes us free from stereotyping, from misinformation, misunderstanding. 
The theme of my life has been building bridges with people and the branching into new beginning. I learned as a physician what life and death actually mean when a person dies. I was the first Palestinian doctor to practice medicine in an Israeli hospital at the Soroka University Hospital and to get the staff position at that hospital. I did it because I believed in it. Because I believe health and medicine have one color, one face, one culture. It's a human. Medicine and health are the human equalizer, stabilizer, socializer, and harmonizer. The happiest moment in my life is when I handle the baby to his mother. The cry of the newborn baby is a cry of a new life, cry of hope. No one can differentiate between the cry of the newborn, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Druze. But always I was worried about this child. What a future are we preparing for this newborn baby? Because we are accountable to these children. And we need to learn from our children. And this is one of the messages I want you to take with you, to listen to your children. I was blessed to have six lovely, beautiful daughters that I raised them to be fighters for peace and for humanity. I learned from my eldest daughter, Bisan, when I sent to peace camps at the age of 14. She said to me, everything starts small, then becomes big. Everything starts in one place and goes in different directions. I am happy this conference starts here. 200 people, but we must not underestimate the impact of this conference, that it will spread everywhere in this world. It encourages, it inspires us to do something and to take action. My daughter said, to meet violence with violence doesn't solve the problem. There is another way. When she went there and she came back, she said to me, I learned how similar are we as Palestinians and Israelis, Muslims, Jewish, and Christians. Our children discovered how similar are we. And we as adults, we create the divide and the differences and we deepen it. So it's important to engage and to listen to our children and to be part because it's their future, it's their life and we are accountable to them. But at the same time, I saw the death of my beloved daughters. 16th of January 2009 is the day when an Israeli tank to shell my house killing three daughters and one niece. For nothing they did. They were innocent girls. I am proud of them in their life and in their death. I wanted them to succeed and to be human and to fight for humanity. Their teachers were fighting to have them in their classes. They never succeeded, less than 97% in the high school. I don't want anyone on earth to see what did I see at that moment. These beloved daughters, they became barks, 
spreading everywhere their bodies, their brain. Even I wanted to recognize them, to see them, to hug them. I can't recognize. Mayar, who was 15, who planned to be a medical doctor to follow my path, he said was 20 years old. Just four months later, was supposed to get her BA. Aya was 14, planned to be a lawyer to advocate for human rights. My niece Noor was 17. At that moment, I lost faith in the humanity. Humanity which was watching, as it's watching it, what is happening these days in Palestine. But I directed my face as a person of faith. I directed my face to the one who always is awake, who always is watching and is there to help us. I directed my face to God. I asked and seeked help from God. While seeing my daughters, the only two words I used to say, O oh God, O oh Lord, give me the strength, the patience to manage the situation. I am blessed to be a medical doctor to manage emergency situation. So I dealt with it as emergency situation and not to think of those who were killed, to think of those who were wounded, because the priority is for the living. And what can I do for those who were wounded? My daughter, Shada, my niece, Gaida, and I kept moving because, as Einstein said, Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep balanced, we must keep moving. I kept moving stronger, more determined, not to give up or forget my beloved daughters. I don't need to live in a constant aching pain. I don't want to be trapped in the painful moments of my life. I need, I will continue my life never forgetting the dreams, loves, and hopes of my daughters and to bring them justice because they live with me. And in my life, I am accountable to God and to my beloved daughters, whom from here they ask me, I see them, what did you do for us? I say to them, I didn't forget you. I will keep you alive with your human message, with the message of love, mercy, forgiveness, and kindness. I succeeded in my life, but I will never forget from where did I come. And life taught me that nothing is impossible in life. From Jabalia camp, as a refugee, I dreamed to be a medical doctor. And everything I dreamed or planned, I succeeded to achieve. And that's what the strength is, that nothing is impossible in life. This wall, one day it will break down. It will be demolished and wisdom and the freedom of all will prevail. From Jabalia camp to Cairo University, to specialize in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of London, to work in Israel, to go to Harvard. I wasn't born with a golden spoon. I would love, at this moment, if my parents 
and my daughters to be with me here. To be proud as I am proud of them. Because our parents as Palestinians, when they didn't live to see the success and achievements of their children. But we are living for them and we will never forget them or from where did we come. I wrote my book, I Shall Not Hate, because the people were expecting me to be drowning in hatred. But the great Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran once said, tenderness and kindness are not signs of weakness and despair, but manifestations of strength and resolution. Some may see tolerance as a weakness and sign us silence as a defeat, but they don't know that resilience and tolerance need greater th power than the power which is needed for revenge. And that resilience is more powerful than words. Resilience and tolerance are positive ways to immunize us to face the challenges. Don't underestimate yourself or your action. The first step in failure is to lose confidence in yourself. And don't reject yourself. Do something. You can be the one you want to be. Hatred for me is a disease. I am obstetrician and gynecologist, but now most of my research, where I believe because hatred is endemic in this world, Hatred is a chronic or acute, contagious, destructive disease. And we need to prevent our people from this destructive disease, which is spreading everywhere, and it's the result of exposure. So I say to you, don't allow hatred. If anyone did something wrong to you, don't allow hatred to approach you. Don't accept to be a victim more than once. Take the responsibility, take this anger in a positive way to challenge and to move forward and not to be trapped in this hatred. I learned, as I said, from my daughters, but my daughter Shada, who was severely wounded. Shada was 17 years old, studying day and night to be one of the top 10 in Palestine in the high school. She was wounded with her sisters. When I saw her with her eye, right eye on her cheek, the globe was ruptured. And her right hand with two fingers, semi-amputated, just attached with a skin tag. Her journey inspired and drive me. She refused to be a victim of this tragedy and to take responsibility. And education was her way out. The antidote of hatred and revenge is success and education. While in the hospital, at the Israeli hospital where I worked at, she was wounded 16th of January, and her birthday was 20th of January. He said, Shada, we have to celebrate your birthday. That's the Palestinian people who live life, and they want to enjoy life. They don't hate others. And what she suffered in four months, mountains can't tolerate it. 16th of September, 2008, she lost her mother of acute leukemia. Then 16th of January, 2009, three sisters and Denise were killed and she was severely wounded. She said to me, if I lose the sight in my right eye, I have my left. If I can't write with my right hand, from tomorrow to start to exercise with my left hand. I will continue to work to achieve the hopes and the dreams 
of my sisters. She lost the sight in her right eye, but she didn't lose the wisdom and the determination and the faith in God. She spent four months at the hospital, and I didn't expect much from her. After she was discharged from the hospital, she said, I have to do the high school exam. I said, what? Because high school exam in Palestine, it's a national exam for the whole country at the same day from the whole curriculum. What are you doing? She said, no, I have to do it. She did the exam. And the day they announced the result in the radio, Shada succeeded as nothing happened to her. 96%. And that's the hope. That's the hope we need, that nothing is impossible. Our children proved it in life. And that's the Palestinian people we can learn from. <laughs> 16 of June 2015, she graduated from the School of Engineering at the University of Toronto. And that's the message she sends to her sisters, that you are alive and will be kept alive among us. I am in debt in my life to my mother. And for me, the Palestinian mother, as every mother, she is the hero behind the survival story of the Palestinian people. All the respect to other leaders, but the Palestinian mother is the one we have to acknowledge and to praise. And the orphan is not the one who loses the father. The orphan is the one who loses the mother. The mother is the main pillar, is the incubator, the one who unites. So after the tragedy, a friend of mine said to me, people will forget, I said to myself, am I going to forget my daughters? I started thinking what I can do to prove to people that I didn't forget. Hearing every day the voices of Bisan, Mayar, Aya, and Noor, talking to me and saying to me, don't weep us, achieve our dreams. Continue the journey we started. I can't say and will never say that they are dead. They are just away from me. They left it quickly with a cheery smile. They've left it quickly, like lightning. They didn't say even to them when they were buried. I wasn't able to say to them a word farewell because I was with my daughter Shada at the hospital. They have left and we are in desperate need of them, but Death is not the end, and can never be the end. Death is the road, and we are travelers. The departure of our loved ones has large and great meanings. They didn't leave. They were the simplest people in their life, and have a great understanding of life. They are the closest to people with their souls and their spirits. They rejected violence and never hurt anyone's feelings. They were never anyone's enemies. They refused to hate. We passed on and our names are eternal. What did you do for us? Today and every day, I say to them, we don't weep you. Rest in peace. You are alive and will be kept alive. Their names are written now in the stone 
on their tombs. But I swore to God and to them, their names will be written on institutions for education of girls and young women in this world because the strongest members in any society and other societies are women. <coughs> Education is a means to achieve our human goals and must have a social a human impact. That's why in their memory, I established Daughters for Life Foundation for education of girls and young women from the Middle East, relative to their background, Palestinians, Israelis, Jordanians, Syrians, Lebanese, Muslims, Jewish, Christians, Druze, who are succeeding from hardship. It's time to give and to keep their names in the hearts and souls of these young women by now, we have about 500 young women that we supported and educated. End of the month, we have the sixth annual gala dinner for Daughters for Life in Toronto. And this year, we are giving the award to the first woman to be a mayor of Bethlehem City, Dr. Vera Baboon. The second award to a Canadian a human rights advocate, a Jewish guy, Dr. Michael Dan, and the third to Christian Amampur, who came to cover the tragedy in 2009. Education and peace must be translated into bread or rice, shelter, health, justice, safety, and peace. Education and humanity should unite us to find solutions to our human problems, education which builds a new generation who believe, who believes that a human civilization is a joint active a project in a time and the world of despair and loss of hope. Women have maintained hope. That's why I am optimistic and will keep hopeful Women are the balance of our world. Women are the reason the world has made it this far. And women are the only hope in this world has to rise up and reach its greatness. All humans are capable of achieving, not just imagining. Women who give life, women who nurture life, instead of saying, Behind a successful man, there is a successful woman. It's time to say, side by side to a successful man, there is a successful woman. I fully believe if women can't make it better, they will never make it worse as it is now. So it's time to give them the try and to give them the opportunity. So establishing a safe, secure, just, and peaceful world is the function of women's education and role. Helen Keller said, I am only one. But still, I am one. I can't do everything. But still, I can do something. And just because I can't do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. And education, peace, freedom, justice, disease, they depend on who you are and where you are. So we need to equalize between people. So we need to fight for the rights, truth, freedom, and justice for all. No one can be ignorant and free. Fear and incitement is used these days as a weapon and exploited to advance the interest of an entity or a group agenda. 
This is what we call fear-mongering. And it's our responsibility to avoid falling victims to political propaganda. I encourage you to look around, to ask, to learn, connect, respect others, act and show passion. Break the silence and speak loudly in one voice, saying the words, no to violence, suffering, injustice, and extremism by sharing our humanity and realizing that there are no passengers on the spaceship Earth. We all are a crew. If you can't say the right word, don't upload the wrong. <laughs> to say in one voice, enough pain, killing, bloodshed, and destruction. That's what is needed. My freedom is from others' freedom. No one is free as long as others are not. It's time to stand for the freedom, justice, and peace for all. No, my rights are from your rights. My life is linked to your life. My security is from other security. And I say it to my Israeli neighbors and colleagues, because I will never use the word enemy. As some use it. And we must avoid saying any bad word. As I said, if we don't have the good word, don't say the bad word. We have to be neighbors one day. So we must avoid these provocative words as enemies in a hostile way. I say to them, your safety, your security, your freedom, your future, and independence is not only linked, but also dependent on Palestinians. Safety, security, and the freedom. We live together, and God created us to live together as neighbors. Whatever we go with violence, there is no other way than respecting each other and live together. So it's time not to turn a deaf ears. So it's a time for action. Hope is a word, but we need to have hope and to have faith. And we need, other than that faith, we need to have the hope and to act to achieve this hope. As Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the actions, the silence of our friends. We are born, we live, and we die. That's the basic human life cycle. What do we do in between and whether our death is simply our fading away or the resonance of our actions and the legacy we leave behind. In life, one can do everything, but each of us can do something. Let us all, old and young, men and women, to come together to make the world a better one. And in our life, we have a priority. The priority in life is not the past. The past is to learn from him. When I take the medical history of the patient, it's not to blame the patient, but to understand the situation, to help me in reaching a diagnosis, and to set up the present and the future. So the priority for us is the present and the future. But who is the present and the future? Our children are the present and the future. What legacy do we want to inherit our children? A heavy mortgage and suffering. We love our children. We need to show that we love our children. And the faithful person will never be a faithful if he doesn't love for others what he loves for himself. 
let all of us have faith, have hope, and act to make the 21st century century of women's education, women's role, and the freedom and justice for Palestinians and Israelis. Thank you, and God bless you.